Good evening, everyone. Thank you for making time on Zoom to spend with all of us. Um, we're going to have three speakers tonight, and we're also going to go over um, bar exam scheduling and what an student ambassador does. I'm Candace Miller. Um, I am a student ambassador for the Maryland State Bar Association, and Pernita is also a Maryland State Bar Association ambassador. We just wanted to welcome you guys to um, the fall event, the MSBA ambassadors. We put on an event, um, one in the spring semester, one in the fall semester. So this one is our fall presentation and it's called Alumni in the Law. So we have brought together some Maryland alumni or alum and they're gonna be sharing some, ex some of their experiences with you. So we're excited um, for this event and we'll get started. So as already uh, explained, just we just did our welcome. Um, Pernita is going to introduce the panelists and they're going to discuss a little bit of their experience and where they're at right now. Um, then we'll discuss what a Maryland State Bar Association ambassador is, um, when the application period opens up for that, um, bar exam deadlines for those of us that will be taking the bar soon, and then we're going to have a costume contest. We'll vote for whatever costume we think is best from Halloween. Um, if you're on here and you still haven't submitted one, it can be of your pet, uh, of you or your children, you can still submit that to Pernita. Um, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. All right. Okay, so first I'd like to um, introduce our panelists. I'll start with Ms. Ashley Miller. She is a University of Baltimore alum from the class of 2018 and she is an assistant state's attorney in Baltimore City. Um, Ashley, would you like to just briefly tell us um, what you do as a, a state's attorney, assistant state's attorney? Do you mean in my day-to-day? -day, um, yeah, just brief, sure. just briefly, because we'll get into some, you know, some questions during the panel discussion, but just kind of briefly introduce your job as an assistant state's attorney. Sure. So. Um, I am an assistant state's attorney in Baltimore City. Um, I currently am transitioning from juvenile felony to misdemeanor jury trials. And so um, obviously right now things are a little bit different as far as my day-to-day -day operations. Um, but typically, I guess, depending on whether you're in like the district court or the circuit court, in the district court you have between 50 and um, maybe 150 cases a week that you're just kind of um, pumping out, um, less preparation and more uh, litigation and court experience, uh, which is what I've primarily been doing for the past year or two. Um, circuit court is more um, lengthy preparation and um, probably equal preparation with court time. And so that's, um, I can go more into it. Uh, but that's pretty much what I do. Thank you. And we look forward to hearing more later. Next, we have Ms. Uh, Lila, Lilia Parker, and I apologize if I didn't say that right, who is um, an alum of University of Baltimore, class of 2017. She's currently an associate at, a, um, at Saul Ewing Arnstein and, and Lair, which is uh, big law. Ms. Parker, do you, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you do as an associate in Big Law? Sure, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I am a litigation associate in our Baltimore office, and my day-to-day -day generally consists of managing between five or six cases that I've pretty much had since the firm um, or partner has brought the case in. This can range from discovery requests, um, deposition prep, um, prep, as well as uh, a lot of drafting of motions and appellate briefs. So that's primarily what I do. The topics range from uh, labor and employment issues to uh, just general breach of contract disputes, um, as well as a little higher ed um, practice as well. Thank you. We look forward to hearing from you more. And our third and um, our third panelist for this evening is Mr. Daniel Moore. 
He's an alum from the University of Maryland, the class of 2019, and he is currently a judicial law clerk at the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland. Mr. Moore, can you tell us a little bit about what you do um, day to day? Of course, uh, and also thank you very much for having me this evening. Um, before I began my clerkship this year uh, on the district court, I was actually an appellate law clerk as well. So I'll try and give a brief day-to-day uh, -day of both of those worlds because they are very different. Um, in the U.S. District Court, um, I'm clerking for Judge Colson. He's a magistrate judge uh, in the system. It, most of my role uh, is to essentially manage his docket. Um, he has several cases that are on referral from the district judges, um, which everything from filing a complaint to um, final disposition of the case. That can include uh, discovery motions, pretrial hearings, uh, pretrial motions such as motions in limine. Um, it's a very fast-paced um, job and, and uh, no two days have been the same since I started. Um, my last job as a law clerk, um, I was on the Court of Appeals. Um, in that position, it was more of bench memoranda, writing um, memos to the judge in advance of oral argument um, to encompass what, what the parties are arguing in each case. Um, my independent kind of thought process of what I might think the right result is um, and presenting essentially everything to the judge um, before oral argument so that they can make the ultimate decision. Um, in that, in addition to bench memoranda, um, there's obviously a lot of opinion drafting. Um, I'll say that's the same in the district court too, is a lot of um, opinion drafting. I think the only difference is in the district court, they're relatively short and concise opinions and the appellate courts, as you can imagine, they're a little longer. Um, much like what you'd read in your case books. Uh, across both jobs, though, it is very research intensive. So uh, there is research and, and obviously a lot of writing in both. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to hearing from you more. <laughs> um, next, we're going to move right into our panel discussion. Um, just, and um, we have some questions for our panelists. But if you have any questions for them, we have the Q&A session to, at the end of this program, but you can also put them in the chat and Candace will be monitoring the chat. And if your questions are not answered during the discussion, the panelist discussion, we'll get to them or we'll ask them um, during the Q&A session. All right, so what we like to do is just kind of, um, you know, the, the goal of this event was to get some insight for law students like myself and Candace and a lot of the other um, attendees who are on today. Just kind of a day in the life. Um, you know, for me personally, I, you know, I'm third year and I still don't know exactly what I want to do. I came into law school kind of, you know, having a pinpoint in what I thought and each, each class, each semester, each year, my head is on a swivel. And so, you know, I like a little bit of some things and I know some things I don't like. And so things like this are really helpful for me to, you know, and a lot of students to hear what it's actually like after law school to get into some of these career um, paths. And um, so we're looking forward to hearing what the three of you have as far as insight to offer us in that way. So um, Candace and I will be toggling um, some of the questions some of the questions we may ask all three panelists to respond, and some we may just um, defer to one or the other or, or two. Um, so we'll get, go ahead and get started. Oops, sorry. All right, so question one is, um, how or when did you know that you wanted to work in um, the state's attorney's office? And that's for you, um, Ashley. So I have an interesting perspective because I actually knew from the time I went into law school that I wanted to do criminal law. Uh, I did not know whether I wanted to do defense or prosecution. Um, my backstory is that my mom's cousin, so my cousin, but distant cousin, um, was actually incarcerated. And he was the first person um, in the United States that was exonerated through DNA um, from death row. And so he had served nine years, almost nine years um, in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Um, and this was back in the late 80s, early 90s, before they were using DNA in cases. And so luckily, once they did that, he was released. I always thought I wanted to be a defense attorney because of that. I really wanted to target um, cases in which I thought 
uh, could be wrongfully convicted, but also um, being able to help defendants as a whole uh, kind of maneuver through the criminal justice system. I had a class in law school. Um, I don't know if anyone knows Professor Grossman, but I, he was a, a, a state's attorney in New York, and I had lengthy conversations with him about the power of the prosecution and the ability to impact the criminal justice system as a whole through prosecution, uh, because you're contacting the victims and you're obviously helping them uh, get justice in their eyes, but you're also able to look at the circumstances uh, surrounding the, the defendants and kind of basing your case off of everything involved. Um, and so I found that I'm really happy with what I do as far as feeling like I'm making an impact on the criminal justice system as a whole, more than I could as a defense attorney, I'm kind of fighting the system the entire time and not really having the ability to, to change anything. Um, so that's how I knew I wanted to be a prosecutor and I'll probably be a, lifelong prosecutor, but it's definitely different than a lot of people who enter law school, so. Thank you. Um, and for Ms. Uh, Parker, um, you know, big law is, I, I was, we were, I've been told that big law is not for everyone. Um, there's, you know, a lot of working hours, but there's also great advantages to big law. Can you share a little bit about how and um, when you came to know that big law was for you? So I'll start by saying that any, any sort of law isn't for everyone. It's not just big law. I know a lot of people get frightened by the idea of practicing in that space, but you know, I, I would say family law isn't for everyone. Well, criminal defense isn't for everyone. So it's really about you know, how you want to spend your day and what really drives you um, day in and day out. Um, so that's just one part. Um, so what I'll say is I, unlike Ashley, well, somewhat similar to Ashley and unlike when I started school, I thought I was going to do defense work. Um, I came in knowing that criminal defense is exactly what I wanted to do. And I would say it wasn't until my second year of law school that I had a meeting with um, Janae Bramble and the uh, LCDO. And she's like, I think you should do OCI. And I'm like, there's absolutely no way. I cannot do a law firm life. I don't want to do it. And she's like, just try. Just, you have nothing to lose at, when you come out of this, even if you don't land a summer associate opportunity, you'll at least get, you know, better at interviewing. So I was like, okay, fine, sure. And then here I am, fast forward uh, a few years and I'm at fall. Um, so I will say, if you want, to really get into the nitty gritty of a case. Um, big law is where you can do it. You know, you can really learn the ins and outs of your defense strategy and really take time to dig into um, the plaintiff's weaknesses in their case. Um, it really gives you a chance to learn a lot of different areas as well. Like I, like I said earlier, um, I'm doing labor and employment work. Um, higher ed and you know just general contract work so if you really want to put your fill your plate with different uh, types of law different types of cases big law gives you that opportunity I will say that it is a lot of hours so I'm not even going to sugarcoat it um, it does take a lot of your day um, some days are shorter than others obviously but it does give you a chance to really get good experience. Um, I feel as I, I just know about so many different things from my two years here um, that I don't think I would have had the opportunity to learn about um, had I done you know a different career at it. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Candace, you want to take the next question? Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if you were going to go on to Daniel. Um, so this one will be for you, Daniel, since you haven't spoken yet. Were there any particular practices in law school that you think prepared you well um, for clerking? Yeah, um, 
let me just touch briefly on uh, what was just said about kind of how the role of a law clerk gets you suited kind of almost for practice. Um, Layla, I, she mentioned that the, going to big law might be a good opportunity to really get into the nitty gritty of a case. Um, I think the same is true in clerking, depending on where you are, um, but it is also true of my job that many of the cases that come across my desk, I need to know a lot about the case, a lot about the substance of the law, um, but in, in such a way that I can convey it quickly and concisely without doing too much. Um, and in that way, that's what really helps the judge. And I really enjoy about clerking is getting such broad exposure to employment law, contract law, um, not in my the federal position, but in, in the state courts, family law, estates and trusts. I mean, you name it, if, it's, if there's a law about it, I, it many of the, those types of things have come um, in front of a law clerk. And it's a, a truly wonderful experience, if you don't know what you wanna do, to get a feel for things find out if there's a, a substantive body of law that you either really like or really don't like and, and either one is, is helpful. Um, to the question that was just posed, um, in law school, I, I think I did a little too much. I, I was on the trial team at University of Maryland, the moot court team. Um, I was on journal just because I kind of was in this boat of not being certain of what I wanted to do and so I didn't want to miss out on anything. Um, Retrospectively, I can tell you, I think moot court was probably most helpful in preparing me for research and writing. Um, both trial team and moot court were helpful in getting me to a position where I could speak on my feet um, after reviewing briefs or reviewing motions, walking into the judge's chambers and saying, this has just been filed, these are the arguments, um, and this is what I think we should do. Um, kind of in, in the way that I've already said, uh, that is truly what my job is. So um, being able to do that quickly and without having to kind of learn on the job how to speak and how to articulate um, convincingly, uh, which is really the job of any lawyer, uh, and to write the same after you've had the conversation. So um, I think any cur extracurricular activities are helpful, um, not to mention almost any internship where you are out there researching and writing either on behalf of clients with supervising attorneys. Um, I think I was interning almost every semester or in a clinic every semester of law school. Uh, and I, I still look fondly back on those experiences and, and how they've shaped my ability to serve as an effective clerk. Thank Can you. I jump in really quickly? Yes. Daniel, what did you clerk for um, on the Court of Appeals? So I clerked for Judge Joseph Getty. Uh, he serves as the okay. Western Maryland okay. judge in the court. Yep. Okay, so I clerked for Judge Green. Um, this was like his last year before he retired. Mm -hmm. And I just want to echo everything Daniel said. Um, I loved learning about so many different areas of law during my clerkship. Mm -hmm. And it prepares you, what, no matter what area of law you want to go into, to learn how a judge thinks. And unless you don't want to practice, it's very likely that you, you will need to convince a judge. So that experience really helps you get into the mind of a judge who would ultimately be deciding your cases when you start to practice. So I, I echo everything Daniel said. It's a really, really good opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay, our next question is, and this would be for um, Ashley, and then back to Daniel. Um, what are some of the most satisfying and challenging parts of the work that you do, um, Ashley, as an assistant state's attorney, and then Daniel as a um, judicial law clerk? So I will start with the most challenging. Um, it, a lot of people think that if you go into criminal law, it's actually less um, work or less hours than big law. And I will say, um, especially throughout district court, I was putting in 90 to 100 hours a week, just because the caseload is so heavy. And it's really about how much you want to put in that case. Um, and so it really is a lot of work. And, um, you know, you're overworked, underpaid kind of kind of thing. Um, with that being said, uh, like I was saying earlier, the ability to kind of change the criminal justice system, um, I think is 
really rewarding. Um, I was a homicide law clerk before I became an assistant state's attorney and working those cases and being able to uh, talk to the victims before and after the case and know the impact that you're having um, is just, it's really rewarding. And I think that in and of itself, just getting to kind of see, stepping back after your cases and getting to see victims and defendants that you feel like you, um, by you being the assistant state's attorney or the prosecutor, um, you were able to impact or change something that maybe wouldn't have been the case if you weren't the prosecutor. And so it's very rewarding, but also, like I said, it is um, a lot of hours, it, depending on how much you want to put in those cases. And I think the only way to, to effectively uh, be a prosecutor is to just treat each case 100%. And so that ends up being very time consuming um, and you're not getting paid uh, the way you should. So you kind of have to balance those two things. Thank you. Daniel, can you answer the same question? What are some of sure. the most rewarding and challenges of your job? So I will touch on a couple uh, in both categories, but if anybody wants an elaboration later on, feel free to shoot a question over. Um, I think some of the most satisfying things to me, um, it was a little more prevalent, um, well, it's, it's true in both of my roles, that the ability to work on real cases that have great importance to not only the parties, every, every case is important to the parties, but to other litigants who may come before the court in the future. Um, that was truly palpable in the Court of Appeals when, when you get an appeal to the highest court in Maryland and the briefs are on your desk and you're thinking, what I'm looking at and what I'm and researching and writing for the judge who, who will decide this one way or the other, and obviously the Court of Appeals is a panel of seven judges, um, it, it really feels like very meaningful work uh, coming, especially right out of law school. Um, as I'm sure many of you, you know, the research assignments and, and draft things you'll do in your, your 1L and 2L and even 3L courses of writing a motion for summary judgment or writing an appellate brief, um, it feels very real once you, you are in the seat and you are becoming, uh, at least assisting the decision maker. Um, and I think that's one of the coolest things about clerking is you get to, to work um, instantly on really substantive cases. Um, and it's always cool when you get to read about them in the daily record or the paper down the road um, and think, wow, I was involved in the back end of the decision making. Um, another, I think, very satisfying thing to me is being able to see and watch my writing technique and ability to improve over the course of not only one for me, but two clerkships. Um, I recently reread the very first opinion that I drafted. And then this was at the end of my clerkship. I looked at the one that I had most recently written and the improvements are, are very tangible um, over just the course of a year. Writing is, is obviously a large part of a lawyer's craft um, and clerking is definitely one of, I think the best ways to get very, very quickly thrown into a, a position where you need to write, you're writing every day. Um, and, and when you do that and you have co-clerks or you have a judge reviewing it, um, that's when you truly improve, um, regardless of how much uh, feedback or improvement you've gotten in law school. Um, I think one of the most challenging things uh, kind of dovetails off of what I first said is the fear of you have these substantive cases before you and, and you are, are fairly influential in deciding them um, because the, the role of a law clerk is very trusted with the judge. And at least part of my fear, um, especially when I started my first clerkship, but still when I started my second was the fear of getting it right. Um, there are some things that obviously the workload of a judge is, is, is pretty hefty. Um, and if, if you provide a memo or a, a, a draft opinion to a judge and they review it and they say, looks good, great, send it out. Um, you think to yourself, I just graduated law school a year ago. Um, are you sure you don't wanna change anything? Are you sure you don't wanna look at it just a little closer? Um, that can be daunting. Um, but I, I promise you that would wear off with a little age, um, but it is one of those things where you, you doubly, are doubly certain before you send it and you, you proofread it twice or maybe three times uh, just to make sure that you are, are doing your level best to make sure you're getting it right because um, that obviously impacts other people and other parties and litigants.
Okay, so if anyone, no one else wants to jump in, I can move into the next question. Thank you for that answer. Um, a lot of people consider if they, whether they should clerk or not, uh, especially right now, because I know applications will be opening up soon. Um, so that's really helpful to hear about all the benefits. Um, I'm gonna go to Layla for this. Please correct me if I say your name wrong. Um, but what are some of common misconceptions that people have um, working in big law or working for a firm? Um, I'll, I can only speak, I'll speak to my misconceptions. I thought it, it was a place where I would get like verbally abused <laughs> a little bit. Um, you have partners who are really demanding and you, you know, you, you look, you watch the shows and you hear the horror stories. And then, you know, when I got to Saul, I did not experience that. Everyone was extremely supportive. Um, they understand that as a first year, second year, third year associate, you have a lot to learn. And they're not expecting you, you know, to come in with the knowledge that someone who's been practicing for 15, 20 years has. Um, so that was one misconception. Um, I would say another is the type of work that you'll do. Um, I'm not sure if you all have heard, but uh, about doc reviews, are you familiar with, with that? Okay, so I hadn't heard about it before I started. And I came in thinking that I was going to do a lot of, you know, drafting and um, of motions and things of that nature. But I will say a significant amount of your time, if you're a new associate, will be dedicated to doc review. And what doc review is literally what it sounds like. You get documents from the other side or documents that you intend to produce, and you have to review them. Like I just sent out a production today that was about 3,000 some odd documents. And I had reviewed about 6,000 emails and PDFs and presentations. So that work can, if you don't like to pay attention um, for long periods of time, it can be draining. But I love to just read emails. <laughs> like I like to get into like the story. And it's like a play by play of, of things in real time. So I really like that aspect of it. But that is something that um, I don't think I really knew would be a, a significant amount of my work when I first started. And that tends to decrease as you get uh, more experience uh, within the firm. So. Thank you. And Ashley, if you want to chime in on this question as well and maybe speak about some misconceptions people have um, being an uh, assistant state's attorney. Sure. So I'll echo what was just said. Um, I think when I first started, as far as my misconceptions, I actually thought I was going to be doing a lot more um, litigation uh, in court experience. And don't get me wrong, I do, I'm, you know, before COVID in court every day, calling lots of cases. But a lot of the work that I do is um, reading and going through um, CCTV footage and um, kind of collecting the evidence. And I guess when I, you know, before law school, I thought, oh, well, all the evidence is going to be put on my desk and I'm going to have all this time to go through it and then put on my case. And that's not really um, what happens. You kind of get the statement of probable cause and some bare minimum um, facts and you have to kind of build that case and figure out what evidence you need and, um, and go get it. And so that is not what I thought I was going to be doing. Um, sometimes I like that, sometimes I don't. And then the second misconception I would say as far as a prosecutor is that prosecutors are out to get defendants um, and that we don't care about them or just want to send them to jail. And that's not, not true at all either as I was speaking about earlier. I really try to look at all the circumstances of each defendant. Uh, I will ask the defense attorneys, hey, what's, what's going on with your client? Um, what, what things um, is he or she dealing with that may have caused the, you know, why they committed this crime? And I think that really helps me in order to figure out what, what do they need? Do they need drug services? Do they need um, a job? And especially working in juvenile felony, um, 
you know, ju juveniles need lots of things um, and services, and it's not just throwing them in jail. And so that is a misconception that that's what we're after. And at least in my case, um, that's the total opposite. Thank you. Um, we only have one or two more questions. And so, um, you know, so we can stay on time. The next question is, sorry, I just lost my. <laughs> How important was it for um, you to be a good fit for the cultural climate in the field um, or of the job that you um, accepted or took a position? Did you, I mean, I know coming out of law school is kind of like, I'll work with whoever will take me, you know, for that first job. But then, you know, I realize it also has to be a two way fit. So how important was it for you, um, whether or not you felt comfortable with the kind of organizational culture in, um, and I'll go with you, um, Daniel first, and then um, Ms. Parker. Um, I will respectfully assert, and perhaps my esteemed colleagues will, will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this question is most primed for me. Um, the, the chamber's environment is often so small that if, if you don't really get a feel for personalities and um, make sure that there's a, a jiving connection between you and the judge and even the judicial assistant um, or your co-clerk, it can make for the best year of your life or, or the worst year of your life. Um, obviously, I, th I think a lot of people can say I can work with anybody for a year. Um, but I've had the good fortune um, of, I think, locking out with both, both of the judges and the judicial staffs that I've worked with. Um, and it was a big part of my hiring and, and interview process. Um, I, I think I would urge anybody who is interviewing or, or, or seeking um, to clerk to first reach out to prior clerks. Um, I, I've done that on almost every occasion of if I've interviewed or if I've um, even just before picking which judges I was applying to, um, spoken to some law clerks about their experience, um, speaking to interns who have worked in their chambers to get a feel for what the day-to-day -day is, um, what the kind of work ethic, how, how everything flows. And, and that has been I think my ticket to good success, because like I said, my, my court of appeals clerkship, um, I had an excellent judge and staff, um, and we had a terrific year, not only doing good work, but also having a lot of fun while doing it. Um, I think the pandemic um, put a little stress on that, um, not to make the situation bad, but um, I think even more so, we were better able to pick up the phone, call each other, stay in touch, um, and it, it, it tested our limits, but it, it for the better, I think. Um, and the same goes for my, my district court experience um, that I've had some very good, very good times with my chambers um, because the culture was very important to me. And, and you asked point uh, blank in, in my interview process if it's important to the judge and to the staff as well. Um, and that's, I think, the best way to find out, so. Thank you so much. That's very insightful. Um, Ms. Parker, um, the same question for you. You can call me Leela. You don't have to say this. <laughs> okay. um, so I think I think any job that you take, I know you know things can be challenging right now due to the economy. But I really think as much as you possibly can, you should view it as you would when you're selecting a partner, a romantic partner, and that is about compatibility. You don't get into a relationship expecting it to end, you know, a week later. You want a partner where you can work with and they can work with you and you can have fun and be happy. And I think jobs and careers are just the same as a partner. You know, I'll, I spend more time with my colleagues, well, at least pre-COVID, I spent more time with my colleagues than I did with my family at times. And you want to make sure that you can enjoy those long hours. So it was very important for me to be able to work with people that one, respected me, um, two, understood me, supported me, and also had the same sort of work ethic and mindset. Um, and just to echo Daniel, that was even more <laughs> required during the clerkship. I had an opportunity to intern with Judge Green before I started. So I got to learn his personality. He was very laid back. I'm very laid back, so we were, 
that I can do this. <laughs> I can clerk for a year. Um, but it's just really important to get a feel for the the vibe and the energy of wherever you're going to work because everyone excels when they have a place that they feel comfortable in and they're confident in, in doing the work. And I think that's really, really important. Um, as much as you possibly can, seek out those opportunities that align with, you know, your personality and your strengths and, and your weaknesses. Thank you so much. And we just have one last question. I think Candace is going to propose that question. Um, so the MSBA, we're going to circle this all the way back around, is about networking and getting to know people. So how important do you believe networking either was in you finding the position that you're in right now or even after you landed your first job and moving uh, through career paths? And we'll go to Ashley for this first since we just ended it uh, with Ms. Parker. Sure. So <clears throat> I think my experience is going to be slightly different um, than my colleagues because I knew I wanted to go to the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office. I knew I wanted to do prosecution um, by halfway through law school and I knew that Baltimore City is where I wanted to be because I can make the most impact. I think as far as networking, um, I did a lot of networking throughout law school and building relationships with the people in the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office. Um, but kind of tailored my networking to that office. And um, I think it really helped me as far as getting my position. Um, and, but then throughout, throughout my position, when I first started, I kind of lost networking uh, because I didn't feel it was um, as important. And then I started realizing it was equally as important because the law community in Baltimore is so small. And so you need to be able to build a reputation and respect among um, not just those that you know that you see every day. And so I found that kind of networking and branching out was I was able to gain more um, respect from the judges and other colleagues in other fields of law. So I think probably it was less important for me um, doing criminal law when I first started. But definitely networking is will always be a part of um, maintaining your reputation as a lawyer um, in Baltimore. And then Daniel, if you want to answer, um, if there's anything to add. Sure. Um, I think uh, everything that I echo, everything that was just said, and I think it even applies more broadly to just Maryland generally. I mean, Baltimore is an incredibly small market, but even Maryland is an incredibly small market. Um, I will say that maybe it's because I'm a social person, but I, I always enjoy networking uh, and I try and do it uh, as much as I can. Uh, in the role of being a law clerk, it's, it's really incredible, um, not only the access to like a network with your fellow clerks, um, both with the judge that you're working with, but even other judges in the same court. Um, for me last year, working with uh, seven judges on the Court of Appeals, I knew each of their law clerks relatively well, uh, I think to the point where I could pick up the phone and call any of them, um, even today and, and throughout my career. Uh, one of them saw that I was gonna be on this panel and, and texted me saying uh, the bits of advice he would give. Um, I think it's even cool um, working as a law clerk, your network is as big as you, you can really push it. Um, and I, I felt like I really got the opportunity to engage with other judges on the Court of Appeals, uh, judges on the Court of Special Appeals. Um, and I'll say that you don't have to do uh, a clerkship necessarily to get that same kind of access. Interning, um, I know it, it, we mentioned uh, interning with judicial uh, judges before. I interned with judges on the Court of Appeals and the Court of Special Appeals, and I, I had a very similar experience where being in the building, walking in the hallways um, are all great ways to meet other people in that arena. Um, I think the one tangible way that as a law clerk, I've really pushed it um, is, is hosting, hosting um, law clerk lunches in, in the Court of Appeals uh, and the U.S. District Court. We do it by Zoom. Um, there's a rich tradition of, of law clerks getting together for lunch, uh, and it's a great way to socially just get to know each other. Um, and I think that's, that's how you make some good connections, um, but also friends. And then also 
you, you, you can talk professionally about cases that are happening. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to just doing the little things that you can given your situation, like right now with, with the pandemic, um, Zoom has been key in getting to talk to some of the law clerks that I otherwise wouldn't um, because we're not in the courthouse as much. Um, and so network, network, network as much as you can and as often as you can. Um, it's really, like has been said, very key to your success um, and your, your reputation in the community. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to move on to our next section of our event and we do have some questions that have come through the chat so if our three panelists would just hold on for um, a minute we're gonna um, talk a little bit about the MSBA ambassadorship program Let me go back in Um, and so we have three student ambassadors on the um, on the event today. Um, myself, Candace, who was also asking some of the questions on the panel, and the former MSBA um, panelist from 2019, Ms. Tina Azervant. Is it Vand or Hand? I'm sorry. Answer Vand. All right, so we're just gonna um, share a little bit about our experiences. Um, Candice, I think, were you gonna start this off or was I? Yeah, so we're gonna kick it off with Tina and she's going to explain, cause she was actually one of the first uh, Maryland State Bar Association student ambassadors. So she's just gonna explain uh, generally what a student ambassador is um, and then I guess her experience with it. Sure, so yeah, they started this program in 2019, I think. Um, but basically what a student ambassador does is they basically promote the MSBA, but it is very independent where you're able to find like your niche area that you like and you can go attend those events, you plan events for students, you attend the annual meeting in Ocean City when there's no COVID. Um, you do a lot of different things, but it's definitely a cool experience. Um, when I was ambassador, we had a Taco Tuesday to entice students to get involved with the MSBA and that was really cool. Um, I think that was the biggest thing and doing like alternative spring break also without COVID. Um, there's a lot of cool things, but yeah, so. Um, and I'm just gonna share, I guess, my favorite part of being a student ambassador. So um, I decided to apply for it because well, Tina and I were good friends and she was like, it's great, you should do it. And that was part of the reason I did it, but also because I wanted to network um, and, and be able to do that, uh, not just at school events, but go to the Maryland State Bar Association meetings uh, for, I guess, the young lawyer section. That's kind of where I fit in. But also uh, working with Angela, she's great at connecting you with perspective areas of interest. So for me personally, um, I'm interested in estates and trusts and working with Angela, she's actually connected me to the estates and trust section and I've been able to work with them when um, creating uh, or trying to push new legislation on certain issues. So that's been really rewarding. But also I enjoy being able to present these sort of opportunities to students at uh, UB and UMD because I think it's important and often networking is not something that people harp on as being important. So that's that's my experience with it and why I like doing it. And I'll hand it over to Pranita. Uh, sure, so I'll talk about, um, you know, my experience actually really mirrors Candace's as far as why I applied. Um, I actually went to law school in Minnesota for the first year. And then I realized, you know, studying all Minnesota law and all my connections were there, but I live in Maryland. And I was thinking, you know, once I got the, you know, realized that networking is really key and all of my connections were Minnesota connections. And I thought, well, after graduation, then I'll have to insert myself into the, you know, DMV, Maryland, DC, um, Virginia, where there's a ton of law schools and everybody will already know everybody. And so I thought, I should probably be on my home turf and get involved early. And so that was the reason I applied and then actually, um, you know, it actually did uh, exactly what I thought 
by being a part of the MSBA, I've attended a lot of the um, local events, you know, pre-COVID. I've been able to meet, as Candace said, um, Angela has connected me also with um, the trust and estates committees where I'm interested interested in and you know other areas and so I just think overall you have access to um, other lawyers and, and events that you may not necessarily be either aware of as a law student right away or may not know how to get involved so in that aspect I think it was a really great decision um, and then quickly um, maybe Tina can tell us a little bit about um, just some of the Post because she's our she's graduated some of the post benefits um, that either you see or you've experienced as part of your MSBA uh, experience. Sure. So I actually cool thing about my job is I met one of the partners during the MSBA annual meeting and I remember it was when I was a one L in the summer and like some upperclassmen told me they're like if you go to this meeting and like don't have a job like you did a bad job. <laughs> and like, because it is very easy to network and everything. Um, so I would say for me, that was like the largest benefit of it is like, I was able to really put myself out there and like, it gave me an opportunity to get involved. For example, I'm obsessed with tax law. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start going to the tax specific events. And then I like kept running into the partners and like, da da da. And then that ultimately led to like me being a law clerk here from having met them at this event. And then I like accepted it offer for once bar results and assuming I pass like I'll be an attorney here so it's really cool um but I would say that was the biggest thing is because I'm from out of state um so coming out here I was like great I don't know a single person like closer than like New York so this is going to be fun to network and put myself out there but I feel like because of the ambassador program and everything um I was able to just like do it and everything because they're like okay go to these events and like they keep you informed and in the loop and everything that's a really good thing about msba so i honestly feel like if i wasn't involved i probably wouldn't work here so shout out to msba for that putting on good events thank you tina and really quick angela since we have you can you just um tell any of the students who are on when the next um application season will start or next for 2021 ambassadors Sure, thank you, Bernita. Um, so our next uh, round of student ambassadors um, applications will be due by the end of 2020. So we are working on the marketing right now. So we will be emailing and um, throwing on our social media um, more information about that. But the program itself will start middle of January and run all the way through December of next year. Okay, thank you. Um, the last thing that, or well, last two things that we have, we have a few questions. I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen and get to those questions. Um, and then we're going to announce the um, costume winner. We got, I believe, five or six entries. So, and they, they all look pretty cool and exciting. And we would really like you all's help to determine um, the best Halloween. They're all great, but we only have one winner for today. So we'll ask for a collective vote on the pictures that we received. But before that, we want to be able to ask the panelists some of the questions that we received in chat. I'll start, but Candice, did you get any as well? No, I haven't received any. So I received a question. Um, it says for Ashley, have you or any of your peers started with judicial clerkships? And did you have any positions interning or clerking outside of the ASA's office before starting in Baltimore City? I recognize the tremendous value in judicial clerkships and the building of strong writing skills, but if I'm passionate about pursuing a career in the ASAO, would it be better to start interning versus a judicial clerkship? So that's a good question. Um, I did do a judicial internship. I did it, um, I believe it was my 1L year. Yeah, I think it was my one all year. Um, but I actually interned um, with the judge that handled the Freddie Gray case in Baltimore City Circuit Court, um, Barry, Judge Barry Williams. And so that was, I think any judicial clerkship is very valuable. Um, I understand that if you know the path that you want to go, uh, I don't want to say it's less valuable, um, 
but it less desirable maybe to to want to do judicial um, clerkship or internship I, I think an internship would be wise, even if you are set on going to the state's attorney's office. I then did clinic my 2L year um, and was a student attorney in the district court for Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office in which I learned so much. Um, and then after that did a, um, was clerking for the homicide unit of the state's attorney's office. So I was able to go through all, all of those steps, but I started with, a judicial internship um, and uh, like was said earlier being able to see how a judge thinks is extremely valuable to be a prosecutor being able to see what drives them crazy about the things that you can do as a prosecutor or a defense attorney um, those are all very valuable so if you can squeeze in a judicial internship or clerkship i think it's very wise um, i also think a clinic or being a student attorney is also um, really great. Thank you. Um, I only received that one question. If anyone has another question, we have time for one more. Um, you can either. I think you muted yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I said, um, thank you, Ashley, for that. And we only, that's the only question we received in the chat, but I said we have time for maybe one more if any of the students on um, has a burning question they want to ask our three panelists. We have, we have time for one more question. While you wait for that, I'll put my email in the chat. I'm happy to speak with anybody who has questions about clerking, um, whether they're specific to, to my judges or, or generally about the process. Um, I've, I've like I said earlier, had great luck speaking with prior clerks and, and future clerks um, about specific chambers and the courts generally. So uh, um, anybody, any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Happy to talk either by email, over the phone, whatever works. Um, so I'll put that out there. Thank you. And um, I did the same. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But um, if you, if anyone has more specific questions about criminal law or about my experience, um, feel free to text me, call me, email me, um, whatever is easiest. Thank you. Hey, Panita, this is Sandy. I'm, I'm a third year evening student at Maryland. I had a question. Sure, go ahead, Sandy. Um, is um, any particular panelists or just in general? No, yep. Um, yeah, so it's for Ashley, Leela, and Daniel. First of all, thank you for um, joining the panel on a very cold November day. Um, my question, I had two questions. One is um, about work-life balance. You know, that's very, I know that's very important because the law can be a jealous mistress. <laughs> and the second one, um, what do, you, do you think there's value in specializing? Like I'm trying to focus on bankruptcy and appellate. Um, do you think there's value in that? Or when you get into the field, is it just like whatever job I get, I, I, you know, I, I get it. Okay, so um, <laughs> if there's any one particular uh, person on the panel who thinks they could tackle um, the question of the, actually the second question I think first and that's about whether or not you know she should, she should focus on um, the specialties that she mentioned so I would say if you during law school you are able to rule out areas of law that you do not want to practice in and you have found you know the thing that really gets you going I don't think it's anything, you know, there's nothing wrong and once you begin your career, continuing along that, that, that passion. Um, but if you haven't had a chance to expose yourself to different areas of law, I would say you may be doing yourself a disservice to dedicate yourself to a specialization um, right out of law school. Um, like I said, I started wanting to do criminal defense and I did work. Um, as a, in the clinic that's no longer at UV doing defense work. And I realized if I wanted to, I would actually rather be a state attorney you know, on the prosec prosecutor side. So I will say only because of that exposure and that work was I able to make that decision. Um, so if you have the exposure, you're able to rule out based on experience and uh, mentors, if you, if you have those, then I would say it's nothing wrong with it, but also keep, you know, keep your mind open as much as you can. Thank you. And for the sake of time, Sandra, if you have further questions or want to talk to any of our panelists who shared their email address, it's in the chat. So I, we didn't get to your work-life balance 
um, question, but I'm sure that's, you know, a very important uh, topic as well. So if you... Um, Feel free to call me Sandy on that one. <laughs> <laughs> During workout. Oh, yeah. thank, you, thank you, everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the last thing we're going to do, is, sorry, we're going to um, review our uh, Halloween costume contest. Um, there is the MSBA has been generous enough to offer a um, a gift card prize to the winner. And um, you know, in light of in light of uh oh, a feedback of everything else that's happening, we thought it'll be a fun little addition to today's uh, meeting. So I'm going to share my screen and put up the pictures. And we were going to do a poll, but we got some of the pictures during this meeting, and so. Um, the poll wouldn't reflect those. So we're just going to ask everybody maybe to put the number, when I put up the screen, put the number of the picture that you think is the best, and they're all great, um, in the chat, and then we'll just tally up those numbers. So I'm going to share the screen again. Let's see. Nope, wrong screen. All right, so here are our entries. We have six. So hopefully, can everyone see the top of my screen? Right. Yes. Okay, so one, uh, two with the little guy as a cop. Number three, Beauty and the Beast. Number four, um, the rainbow dog. Number five, there's a, a fall butterfly. And I have to move my screen over to see number six. Oh, and number six is um, the 70s uh, theme. <laughs> what was that era called? I forgot the, um, back in California, back in the 70s, what was it called? Hippies. Yes, the, yeah. the hippies. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, six entries. And um, if you all can take a look take a minute to look at all six entries and then in the chat just enter your favorite one and we'll tally those up for a winner has everyone entered there does anyone need more time Okay, um, Candace, can you tally up the entries? Because while my screen is up, I can't see the chat. So we have a tie between one and two. So uh -oh. anybody who didn't vote for one or two, now you can cast your vote between one and two to be the tiebreaker. I hope this isn't forecasting for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Or maybe right. we just do a tiebreaker vote for one and two. Yeah, that's, that's what we'll do. Okay. So I think the, there was only one person that didn't vote for one or two. Well, I mean, so now everybody just submit a entry either one or two since they were the tie okay that's fine if you want i think um was one or two in the lead one and two yeah everybody voted for either one I or two I, I changed mine from yeah. three to make it easier even though you, know, Candace, really you look good <laughs> thank you i appreciate it i was beauty and a beast so yeah, um yeah, Candace. So I I believe number two won. So, yeah. yep. Is the rightful owner of number two still on the call? I don't believe, I don't think she is. So I will let her know an email, I guess, afterwards. Okay, so Candace, what is the prize, by the way? The $25 gift card. Oh, okay. Um, from the Maryland State Bar Association because they decided they were gonna gift us during this time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, um, MSBA, for that generous gift. 
And I'd like to thank our um, esteemed panelists for joining us today and offering so much insight uh, for those of us who will be um, walking your walk soon <laughs> and um, you know, be taking your advice and hopefully um, turn it into a successful and career that we're each passionate about. Um, is there any other final comments from Angela at MSVA, any of our panelists or our co-host Candace before we adjourn? I just wanted to say thank you for making time to be on here tonight. I know it was last minute for a lot of the speakers or pretty much all of the speakers. Uh, and it means a lot for you to spend time explaining this, even for people who couldn't make it, it's recorded and we'll post it. Um, and I think this will really help because we're not in the building. So a lot of students are struggling right now to figure out how to find a job or how to make that decision. And I think that all of your points will help them along that path. So thank you for being here and for speaking and offering your contact information. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Nope, I don't have anything. You guys did a great job. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today.